The W Show. Thanks to Nab, Nat Edwards and Daisy Pearce with you as we count down to preliminary finals weekend days. What has the vibe been like around the club this week? Oh, and then there were four. I mean, it's exciting. Good to be through to a final. Last year we got this far but never got to play in it. So looking forward to heading over to Adelaide tomorrow and can't wait. Excitement levels high at all four clubs, I am sure. Let's take a quick look, though, at what has been making news this week. The grand final time is locked and loaded, ready to go Saturday, April 17, 2pm Eastern time. The D's down the Dockers to make a prelim while Tani Brown kicks the match winner for the Pies. It certainly was an epic weekend of football. And on Wednesday, we had an announcement from the AFL that the grand final time was locked in. They're going to move some games around. So it's a standalone game, which it should be. And this was Nicole Livingston speaking yesterday. This is the biggest game of the AFLW season and it deserves clean air and it deserves a standalone spot. So we're, we're really pleased to announce that today and um, there has been no, no issues at all with moving that. In fact, everybody has been really agreeable that it deserves its own slot. So Nicole Livingston, the AFL GM of women's football there and rightly so that it has its own place in the fixture. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's great. Clean air in a very busy footy calendar at the moment. Um, and then the certainty as well. I think in the past yeah. you sort of haven't known where and when, what time, what venue the grand, the grand final was going to be at. Obviously, you've still got to see where it is, but we know the venues it may be at and exactly what time it is so people can get there. It gives it the best time uh, opportunity to shine. So the Adelaide Oval, the Gather, all the mighty MCG could be the three venues. Now, the last time I did some digging, the MCG hosted a women's game. It was actually an exhibition game back in 2016 between the Dees mm. and the Brisbane Lions. And there's this famous photo of you with oh. getting your nose smushed. There's like a full <laughs> face palm going on. Do you remember much I of do, that? I only remember the photo, but it was funny. <laughs> I, I came off, saw the photo and I had no idea that it had happened. So it must have looked more drastic than it actually was because it didn't hurt. <laughs> now, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the fact that there's so much crossover between men's and, and women's season. Would you prefer the women's season to be fully standalone? And, and if that is starting potentially in a November or December, would you be happy with that? Yeah, I've probably changed my tune a little bit on it. Maybe in the past thought, no, stick to the winter time slot. We can we can play at the same time. Let's have double headers, that kind of thing. Whereas now I sort of think a bit of clean air and offering that different product isn't a bad thing. I'd be prepared to yeah start a bit earlier. Now the big question, I know that everyone that watches this show is stop talking that. Just ask her the question, are you going to oh. be suiting up? <laughs> This week um, for the red we, and the blue. We trained tonight, so can't can't answer completely. But trained on Tuesday and made some positive steps and feeling better again today. So it'll be a matter of what I can complete tonight, and then decision for the the coaches and staff, I suppose. So yeah, I just have to keep doing what I can to put my hand up, and ultimately they'll make the decision. Is one of the things at the back of your mind thinking, okay, if the girls can get through this weekend, then maybe I'm better off just holding out for a potential grand final. Is that one of the things that you sort of have to weigh um, up? Well, it is one of, like, one of the things that gets thrown into the mix. I mean, I'd be confident they'll be able to get the job done regardless, as we showed on the weekend. Um, but, yeah, it's a significant thing to be able to give my knee another week, so that will definitely be part of the decision-making, yep. All right, well, we'll wait with bated breath to see how you go at training tonight. But let's take a look at the preliminary finals now. And we will start with Adelaide Oval Saturday afternoon. Now, the last time that you met uh, the Crows, it was a brilliant performance from your Demons at Casey. The pressure that you applied, it was just relentless. Is that going to be the focus again this weekend? Yeah, absolutely. We know Adelaide are a really strong um, contested ball winning side and then they move it really quickly on you. So, um, yeah, that con contested style of play was something we really focused on. It was a wet night as well out at Casey when we yeah. met them last time, so it became even more of a focus. But I think, you know, it might not be wet on the weekend, but given that it's finals footy, it's where it's won and lost. So it'll, it'll, we'll definitely be, have to be at our best again. The Ds have now won five in a row, but a lot of the talk has been been around the Adelaide Crows being the hot favourites. It's obviously at Adelaide Oval. You're going to have the crowd that's going to play potentially a factor as well. 
As a team, do you actually thrive on being the underdogs? <laughs> oh, we don't mind it. Um, yeah, I think we've gone under the radar for most of the year. And, I mean, we head over there to Adelaide Oval to play against a team that's won two premierships, proven themselves on yeah. a big stage. So wouldn't necessarily say people are getting it wrong to call us the underdogs. But, yeah, we'll take it. We'll go over there and try and spoil the party. Let's take a look at some of the key matchups that you've identified. And it really is two elite midfields going head-to-head -head here. Yeah, I mean, Ebony Marinoff, Tyler Hanks is one that will be important. Ebony Marinoff, number three in the comp for metres gained, number nine for disposals, averaging 23 a game. So, um, yeah, she's always important for the Crows, but particularly at Adelaide Oval, it's one of those grounds where centre clearance is really important. So if she gets going and gains that territory, it'll be a factor. And then Tyler Hanks probably got the chocolates over back in round seven she when did. she had 25 and kicked one or two, depending on which way well, you look yes. at goals. Probably um, two. <laughs> yeah, so huge matchup. Eloise Jones on the wing for Adelaide. And she's a really threatening player and exciting when she gets the ball. And then Kate Hoare, who kicked three against the Crows last time. Um, yeah, just ultra dangerous in our forward line every week. And Erin Phillips, you kept her goalless last time. I think she's probably going to be coming out such an experienced finals player as well. She's one that you've got to look at. But on the flip side for the Crows, Maddie Gay, I've just found her last couple of weeks in particular has been sensational, probably spending a little bit more time forward given that you're out of the side. But she was terrific again on the weekend. Yeah, she was. I mean, you're right, she's, an, she's a pretty natural forward when she goes up there and had been doing it a bit um, even prior to me going out. Um, but just so strong in the air. We've yep. seen she's taken some big clutch marks close to goal and been able to go back and slot them. She kicked that important one against Fremantle and then again the match winner on the weekend. But it's this um, contested pressure of tackling, the ferocity in her tackles that I've been really impressed with. Um, yeah, that huge tackle she laid on the weekend just to send that Fremantle player over the line was a pivotal moment in that game. Yeah, she certainly reads the moments well because I remember from that game against the Crows last time she tackled Erin Phillips, <laughs> ran her down in the centre of uh, Casey Fields and that really was a turning point for me in that match. Now, we've discussed a lot about how the Crows have the finals experience. They've obviously got premiership players going around, but one young Crow who doesn't have that experience on the big stage just as yet is last year's pick four in the NAB AFLW draft in Tia Charlton. She could probably give them a little bit of extra spark, though. Yeah, I mean, she's been impressive. Not posting ginormous numbers, nine disposals a game, averaging three tackles. But it's a difficult position as a small forward. But she's played every game yeah. in a side that is hard to crack into. She's kicked the three goals and she's dangerous any time it's in her area. And she's one of those ones, I heard Ebony Marinoff talking about her during the week, that she has a huge impact. So I dare say it's just her positioning, getting to the yeah. right spots, applying pressure. Unlucky to probably not get a Rising Star nomination, but... I dare say we'll be talking about her next year. <laughs> yeah, well, she's just 18 years of age, so the eligibility is until mm. under 21. So she still will be eligible next year for the NAB AFLW Rising Star Award. Speaking of young guns who have impact in finals, Collingwood's father-daughter recruit, Tani Brown, she certainly made her mark kicking the match winner on the weekend and that's your deep dive for the week. Yeah, it was impressive and I mean, just got to the right spot, we'll have a closer look from behind the goals in a minute, but just her temperament, I mean, there was that well documented moment where she kicked the wrong way early in the game, some people might not recover from that, no. but there she is kicking the match winner and we'll just have a look at it here, you see her highlighted to the left of screen. And I liked the leadership and communication. It was Sophie Alexander that pointed to tell her to go across yep. and get in structure. So just the importance of things like that in big finals, big moments. Then Colling would win the clearance and get it forward and just watch the way that she slips in behind her defender and holds her width. So reading this really well off the back of the contest enables her to hit the ball with speed and momentum. That's what gave her the space to get out the back. Uh, it certainly was brilliant and you mentioned of course that behind. I'm sure she hasn't watched the replay of that but she'll watch the replay of that <laughs> match winner for sure. Now let's talk about this next preliminary final and the Brisbane Lions up against Collingwood. The last time they played was in round eight at Witten Oval of all places <laughs> after that game had to be moved. Two really contrasting game styles, isn't it? The Lions like that kick mark and, and the Pies are really handball heavy. How do you sort of see it playing out? Yeah, well, Brisbane have great attention to detail defensively, so that's probably what um, found out Collingwood. It was their first loss of the season and just their ability to deny those handballs and their, their 
um, weapon of getting it to the outside and then being able to use it cleanly. And then defensively, they held up really well also. I, I know Lutkins, Grider, Conan, those girls, I think, averaged about 17 intercept possessions between them a game. So you can have a big dominance in the midfield, as Collingwood often do, but not put it on the scoreboard, yeah. which we've seen a little bit with Collingwood over the last couple of weeks, and that's what happened back in Round 7 also. So that'll be the one to watch. You mentioned Bree Conan as we take a look at some of your key matchups here. And that uh, matchup with Chloe Malloy will be really, really interesting, won't it? Oh, yeah. And she kind of got the wood over her last yep. time, didn't she? Got uh, possessionless until half time yep. and then kept her goalless and only the five touches. So another big matchup. And then Spark on Brianna Davy. It's all we've been talking about da all week. <laughs> Davy <laughs> averaging 24 disposals a game this season, but it was back in round seven when Spark kept her just to 14 and kicked a goal herself going the other way. And knowing how big and strong Davy is at winning it, and then the territory she gains from once she does get it on the boot, um, hugely important. Well, that calling with coach Stephen, uh, Steve Simon spoke about that and he sort of said if the Lions bring that physicality again against Bree that uh, it's actually going to make her go harder at the contest. This was her on the weekend an incredible match, 31 disposals 9 tackles, 7 clearances and 393 metres gained I mean she's, I actually don't know how Kathy managed to tag her out of the game last Kathy's time. Kathy's an amazing <laughs> athlete, she's very strong, powerful but look at the amount of times that Davy has about 3 North Melbourne players hanging off her and she's able to stand up and Incredible. still effectively dispose of it. Steve Simons, he has to say that. Yeah. He knows the tag's going to come yeah. because it worked last time Everyone and he's knows. egging his player on to <laughs> get over the top. And Davey will not shy away from the physical side of it. It's just whether she can continue to have those effective disposals under that kind of relentless pressure that that's what Brisbane will be after. Yeah, I can't wait to see how that matchup plays out. The other interesting move from Steve Simons um, that I wanted to ask you about was Ash Brassel started forward against the Roos and then she went back in the last quarter when they really needed her. What, what's the thinking here and, and I guess do you think that he might spring something like this again? Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think this has a bit to do with the fact that they'd acknowledge they're having pretty good midfield dominance at times. They're winning plenty of clearance, but maybe they're not getting the contest forward of the ball that they want to enable them to score. I mean, round seven against the Lions, they had 30 inside 50s, the Pies, and only managed 13 shots. And then the week before against the Crows, 24 inside 50s and only posted seven shots at goal. So they're not cashing in on that dominance. Brazil isn't going forward to necessarily kick an absolute bag. It'd be about making sure, given she reads the ball so well, yeah. you read it coming in, give us a contest and at least we're, we're able to lock it in and try and score from that. A quick tip before we go as we take a look at the time slots again, just in case you need a reminder, set them in your phone as a reminder so that you can make sure you watch these amazing preliminary finals. You're going to tip the Ds, so what's the, yeah, the tip in the other game? Yeah, that red and blue team might win. <laughs> um, in the other, things, the, the other game, I think the Lions will win just. You, Nat? Ds and Lions for mine. And I'm not saying that because you're sitting right next <laughs> yes, to me, even though I'm protected by this glass. <laughs> so if you want to come and get me, <laughs> if I say the crows, you can't. All right, that is the W show for this weekend. Best of luck to you with your knee and, of course, to the Ds this weekend. Thanks, Nat. Enjoy. We shall. And thank you so much for watching the W show. For all of your finals news, make sure you head to women's.afl. We'll be back again next week for a grand final bonanza.